best. Uh, again, I would encourage people to like shout a question if something is unclear. That's the best I can do because normally I'd see your faces and know what's happening. So the title of this course is A Kinetic View of Statistical Physics. Okay, and um, I am very, uh, I would guess I would call myself a working class type of physicist in the sense that I'm not into uh, formalism, I'm into just being able to solve example problems. And so the point of this course is to show you how to solve a bunch of uh, paradigmatic problems using every trick I know in the mathematical physics book and hopefully from this uh, we gain some wisdom. So let me begin by um, first introducing some, something called the master equation. And so in a, uh, most generally I view the state of a system as being described by a set of points. So this is the state space. Uh, I'm sorry, we can't really see the, the blackboard. Can you see now? Was I, I was standing in the way. Is that okay? Uh, it's, it's a bit too much to the left. Too much uh, to on the left, because on my screen it's just, it's in the range. So uh, I, I just, okay, uh, I just you know, uh, read. Let me just ask, uh, if can you see this line that I just drew? Um, I can't. You cannot? Yeah. You cannot. All right, let me first figure out what the boundaries of the of the of where I can write. Can you see this line? Uh just one moment. Uh yeah, I can. I okay. Can. And now on the right hand side, can you see the line here? Uh, yes. Okay, so yes. this is this is my boundary, so I will not write anywhere here now. Okay. So again, um, and so master equation, and in general, one describes the system. So, shut off the mic if you are not using it. Yeah, if you're not talking, turn off your mic. The state space. Um, is basically a collection of points. So I'm thinking of describing the state of the system by discrete points. I mean, in a classical mechanical system, you could think about a continuous uh, state space, but for stat-mech purposes, it's generally much better to think about a discrete set of points. So there's a point I, and it's described by a probability that you're at point I. And in the canonical ensemble in equilibrium statistical physics, P I is proportional to E to the minus beta energy of the site I. And in general, there will be transitions between two states. Uh, so there will be a Wij, which describes the rate of transition from site I to site J. And um, this, in some sense, is the most, uh, so in equilibrium, you are, you, are, you are given the probabilities of being at each site. In a non-equilibrium situation, one is normally given the transition rates, W, I, J, and then the goal is to understand the evolution of the system in state space. So this is the program that I'm going to try and show for a bunch of paradigmatic examples of how to, given transition rates, how to calculate the evolution of the probability distribution and perhaps understand the equilibrium properties, but also understand the non-equilibrium relaxation properties. So that's the basic goal. So, as I said, this is more an example-driven approach of lecturing. So let me begin by working out some examples. So, examples. And I have to say, I'm finding this extremely awkward because I feel like nothing from the virtual world here. So the first example is a random walk, RW, on a triangle. What? Someone is saying something? So imagine you have your state space, an extremely simple state space, three points, one, two, three, and the transition rates from one to two and two to one, one to three, one to two, uh, and backwards, and two, three, two, one, the transition rates are all the same. And because the overall transition rate doesn't play any role, let's just come, uh, 
let's just take the transition rates equal to one. And what I want to do is I want to compute uh, the evolution of the probability distribution on this uh, triangle. And so I realize already that I forgot something more fundamental here, which is, some, which is the master equation itself. So first I need to go back one step and write down the master equation for some arbitrary set of points with some arbitrary hopping rates. And in general, the master equation has this generic form, pi dot. So the over dot denotes time derivative. And it's a sum of two terms. There is a gain term, a gain of probability, because you could be at some site here and hop to i. And then there's loss because you could be at site i and hop out of site i at some rate wij. And these two terms describe the evolution of the probability in uh, state space. One thing to notice about the master equation as written is that it's a first order equation in time, which means it breaks time reversal invariance. So in general, in, in non-equilibrium non stat mech, we are dealing with approaches to an equilibrium state. And let me write this a little bit more explicitly. So the gain term, this is the sum of all sites J that are nearest neighbor to I, W, J, I, P, J. So if you're at a site J and, the, and there's a rate of hopping J, I to site I, the total probability of hopping from J to I is, is the rate times the probability. And then I have to sum up over all neighbors of I. And then there's the loss term where I'd have to sum up again, over all neighbors to i, w, i, j, p, i. So with the rate w, i, j, you hop from i to some neighboring site, you sum up over all neighboring, you sum up over all neighboring sites, and this is the flux leaving the system. And so in equilibrium, this pro time derivative would be zero, and then you can study the equilibrium properties of the system uh, more generally, as we're going to see, sometimes by taking a non-equilibrium perspective, it turns out that it's actually easier to solve the full time-dependent problem and extract the equilibrium as the long time uh, limit of the solution. So now given this, let us now turn to our example of a random walk in a triangle. So we have P1, the probability being at site 1, P2, P3. And these are all time-dependent probabilities. And so the most general understanding of the problem would be we want to compute pi of t at all times t given some initial condition. Because this is a first order equation in time, all we need to do is specify the initial condition and nothing else. So um, let me write down the master equations for this process. So let's first of all write p1 dot as a function of t. So there is a gain term because it could be at t P2, I could be at site 2 and hop to 1. I could be at 3 and so hop to 1. I could be at 1 and now there's loss terms because I'm at, at 1 and I hop to either 2 or 3. So there's two such terms. And if you put this all together, you'll get P2 plus P3 minus 2P1. And similarly, P2 dot. And by the way, as I go along, like when arguments are kind of obvious, I don't bother writing them, so it's just less writing to do. So P2 is just, you can obtain immediately by cyclic permutation. So P3 plus P1 minus 2P2. And P2 dot, P3 dot, sorry, is equal to uh, P1 plus P2 minus 2P3. And then we have to supplement these equations with an initial condition. And again, one can choose anything, uh, but let me ch choose for simplicity the initial condition that pi at t equals zero is equal to delta i1. That is, I start with a particle at site one. And I want to ask, how does the probability distribution evolve as a function of time? So we have three coupled linear differential equations. We know that first order differential equations have exponential solutions, so you could assume an exponential and work it all out. But uh, again, to try and develop some toolkits for this, a much more elegant way of solving the same problem is by the uh, Laplace transform method. And so I'm going to solve this using Laplace transforms. And so here is where uh, 
having the students here would be very helpful because I would ask, like, how many people have seen the Laplace transform method? And some people would say, I've never seen it before. Some people would say, I'm bored with it. So I'm kind of assuming here that most people have seen it. And so the Laplace transform is defined as pi of s is equal to the integral 0 to infinity e to the minus st pi of t dt. And <clears throat> the reason for doing uh, a Laplace transform or in general any kind of a spectral analysis on a system of, of differential equations is that it usually transforms partial differential equations into ordinary ones or ordinary differential equations to algebraic equations. You should view this as exactly the same as a Fourier transform in space. It takes, you know, differential equations in space and turns them into algebraic equations. So it's a very useful way of simplifying the equations. And so in the case of this system of equations, if you introduce the Laplace transform... No, I mean, in the sense that you're It's general information for everybody. So there is a, a mic uh, sign on the bottom uh, left uh, of your screen uh, that you can turn I'm on, on and off. Okay, so if you want to ask a question, you should turn it uh, on like this and then uh, uh, ask the question. But then uh, uh, if you don't want uh, the noise from your room to be heard from everybody else, then you should turn it off. Okay, thanks. Okay. All right, so anyways, um, as I say, the, these sorts of spectral uh, analyses like Laplace transform, Fourier transform, Mellon transform, generating function, they're all the same. So once you've seen one of these things, the principle behind generating function is the same as the Laplace transform. So let's take this and try and, and see what happens over here. So you see that on the left-hand side we have d by dt. If I, if I take this equation here, for example, and multiply by e to the minus st integrate over all time dt, then on the right-hand side we just have the Laplace transform of these functions. On the left-hand side we have the derivative. And you see just by looking here that making derivative brings down a factor of s. Uh, so just, you know, there's a simple step involving integration by parts that allows you then to take these differential equations and transform them to algebraic equations. So here I'm skipping, and in general through these lectures, I will skip steps which are entirely straightforward, uh, but, you know, are prone to, to error on the blackboard. But if you uh, introduce the Laplace transform here, what you're going to find is S P1 of S now. So I should also say that oftentimes in textbooks they'll put, you put a tilde over this to emphasize that it's a Laplace transform. I like to have minimalist notation, so when it's clear that I'm talking about the Laplace transform, I don't bother with this, so I'm not going to put a tilde here. And that there's an argument S, which is already redundant with the tilde, to note, denote that this is a Laplace transform. But once, I'm used, once we know what we're talking about, then I often don't even bother with the arguments, so things are simple. So anyways, it turns out that when you do this integrate, if you, if you look at the time derivative of P, you integrate it by parts and you get the, the term at, inf you'll get uh, two terms and one is just multiplying by S and one is minus the initial condition. So minus um, P1 at T equals zero. So notice this is the Laplace transform. This is the uh, probability at T equals zero. And uh, if I'm choosing this initial condition, this quantity is just equal to 1. And then on the right-hand side, I have P2 plus P3 minus 2P1. And again, these are all functions of S. And similarly, I have S P2. And now I'm not going to write the argument P2 of S. And it's equal to P3 plus P1 minus 2P2. S P3 is equal to P1 plus P2 minus 2P3. And so one sees that by introducing the Laplace transform, one has reduced a system of linear differential equations to a system of linear algebraic equations. So this is now just grade school algebra to solve. 
This is precisely the kind of thing that I'm very bad at on the blackboard, so I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to tell you what the answer is, and you can just verify for yourself that it's correct. So we have P1 um, of S is equal to S plus 1 divided by S, S plus 3, and P2 equals P3, and that's equal to um, 1 over S, S plus 3. Now, ultimately, what we want to do is solve for this as a function of time, and we, I will do that momentarily. But the point is that just as in like Fourier transform analysis, we're interested in, in Fourier transform analysis, there's a relationship between the Fourier transform of a function and the function itself. And similarly here, there are nice relations between the Laplace transform of the function and the function itself that you can infer without doing any serious calculation. So in general, we're interested in the long time properties of this probability distribution. We like to ask, if I start with a particle here, how is it evolving as a function of time? So it, the question is, what does the t large time limit correspond to in the Laplace domain? And you can see that because everything appears S and T are like reciprocal here, long time, course, um, yeah, long time corresponds to the S going to zero limit of the Laplace transform. So if we examine what happens to these functions as S goes to zero, we can already infer something without doing any work. So let's look at this limit as S is going to zero. So when S goes to zero, we can forget about the S compared to one, so here's one. Then we have one over S, so this is diverging like one over S. But then I have um, s plus 3, and as s goes to 0, we forget about the s compared to 3, and so we get that p1 goes to 1 over 3s. And p2, p3, well, when s goes to 0, forget about this s compared to 3, and we get 1 over 3s. So p2 equals p3 also goes to 1 over 3s. So first thing that we can infer is that in the long time limit, all the Laplace transforms go to a common limit, 1 over 3s, which suggests that in the real time domain, the concentrations at all three sites is going to be the same, it's going to, and, and, and it actually is. And the other thing is that there are simple rules for computing the inverse Laplace transform that are very much like the inverse Fourier transform. And the very first lesson you learn in Laplace space is that the inverse Laplace transform of 1 over s is just constant. So this tells us that for t going to infinity, um, p1 of t equals p2 of t equals p3 of t, and this goes to one-third. So in the long time limit, all the concentrations go to one-third. Another thing that you can infer with no work is that in the limit s going to zero again in the, for the Laplace domain, if you add up these concentrations, so take this plus p2 plus p3, so if s plus 1 plus 1 plus 1, so it's s plus 3 divided by s, s plus 3, the s plus 3 cancels, you get 1 over s. So the summation pi of s is equal to 1 over s. And that's the Laplace transform of the constant 1. So this shows that like the probabilities started off normalized, they stay normalized. I started with the one unit of probability on site 1, and in the long time limit, the sum of the probabilities adds to one, so nothing, was dis nothing has disappeared, nothing is created, which we expect to occur. So the last thing here is now let's ask, what is the behavior as a function of time? So what we have to do is do the inverse Laplace transform. And um, let's just do one term uh, because it's, it's simple, and then the other one we can infer because of normalization. So again, uh, just as when you learn in uh, Fourier transforms, there's like rules for how you go from a Fourier, invert the Fourier transform, there are rules for how you invert the Laplace transform. But, um, and so one basic thing, uh, and I'm running out of space where I'm going to put it, uh, so let me just put it over here, uh, 1 over S plus A, whoops, let me, S plus A. If I want to ask what that corresponds to in the time domain, that's e to the minus at. And the way you can verify this is plug in e to the minus at, so you're integrating e to the minus s plus at dt, and so clearly when you integrate from zero to infinity, you get one over s we plus at. We don't see that. What? 
Yes, so it's it's not really straight the camera, so the that angle is slightly uh, oh, too, is it, is it yeah. too high. Yeah, a little bit. So can you see this perfect. line here? Yes, definitely. Okay, so let me let me put this over here. So one over s plus a corresponds to e to the minus a t. So now can you see that? Okay. So anyways, the point is that. You see that if I plug in e to the minus a t into the definition, into this thing here, I have e to the minus s t, e to the minus a t, I integrate from 0 to infinity, I just get 1 over s plus a. So uh, what I can do here to sort of invert this Laplace transform with little work is let's look at, and, and again, shout if you can't see this, p2. So it doesn't look like just a simple uh, linear thing, but you can do a partial fraction decomposition. This is equal to... Uh, 1 over um, s, let me, let me think for a second, s plus 3. If I add these things up, I have uh, s plus 3. Let's subtract this and then multiply by 1 third. That's the same as this. And so this is nothing more than, so then in the, so that's in, in the Laplace domain. And so in the time domain, we know what the inverse Laplace transform of constant, of 1 over s is. It's just constant. So this is 1 third minus 1 third e to the minus 3t. And um, so that's also the same as p3 of t. Um, I'm afraid to... Let me try and do this. So this is equal to P3 of T. And finally, P1 of T, you can write as equal to 1 minus twice P2 of T, because everything is normalized, and P2 equals P3. So 1 minus P2 minus P3 is, is P1 of T. And so if I can do that subtraction, which is not obvious, 1 minus 2, so that's equal to 1 third... Uh, I have to add one to this. Uh, twice this, add one. So one third plus um, two thirds e to the minus three t. So you see that at t equals zero, this is one, which matches the initial condition. And in the long time limit, all the probabilities decay to uh, one third exponentially in time. So that's a very basic example, but you know, from this example, one can then study the same type of random walk on larger and larger graphs and build some intuition for like how uh, the relaxation time, so this number three here, we can think of this as one over a time. There's a relaxation time, one third, and it's telling us how quickly the system is relaxing to uh, the microcanonical ensemble of equal probabilities at each site. And so one can play with this now, with this example, one can study like four sites, one can study a four site complete graph, one can study any graph you want and develop intuition for how uh, the probability relax, relaxes on simple networks. But one reason for showing this example is paradigmatic, it's very simple, and it begins to introduce the Laplace transform technique as a, as a natural way of solving these sorts of problems. So, I'm hoping this is accessible. I'm hoping it's at the right level, and I'm crossing my fingers. And if uh, nobody is shouting into the microphone, I'm going to continue on. Okay. By the way, what time did I start at? Uh, we stopped, I think, uh, at uh, 11. Okay. Very good. Okay. So what I want to do now is I want to solve exactly the same problem, everything the same, but I want to use the generating function technique because I want to show that line by line, they're exactly identical. Everything conceptually is the same. The details are a little bit more complicated. And in fact, this is an important philosophical point because oftentimes students are first exposed to the random walk in the context of discrete time, discrete space. You say that in each time step, you make a single hop one side or the other. And so conceptually, the discrete time random walk is somewhat simpler. But on the other hand, calculus was invented to make discrete problems into simpler continuum problems. And so you're going to see that the technology for solving the discrete random walk is actually more complicated than solving the continuum random walk. But it's good to show it because as you're going to see, I'm going to use the generating function throughout this uh, 
set of lectures. So with much regret, I'm going to erase some of this because if I had all the blackboard space in the world, I would show everything, every equation would look exactly identical, but I don't have room to do it, so I have to erase. So please excuse that feature. So uh, let's now do a discrete solution. So again, I have my, my triangle, one, two, three. I know I'm standing in front of what I'm writing. I'll get out of the way in a second. And um, I want to write down then the master equations for uh, this process. So um, bear with me a second. Let me find my notes. OK. <clears throat> so um, let me write down the discrete master equation. So here, the basic quantity will be p i of, um, so let me write it over here. Pi of n, that's equal to the probability that random walk on site i at nth step. So it's just the analog of Pi of t. It's just that now the time argument is a discrete argument that changes by one every single time I take a step. And um, so let's write down. Uh, P1 of n. So how can I be at site 1 at the nth step? Well, the only way I can do that is I could have been at site 2 at the previous step and then I hopped over here. And if the hopping rates are all the different, on all the different links are 1, so there will be a term here, uh, P2 of n minus 1. And then there's plus another term because I couldn't have been at 3 and uh, P3 at n minus, one, n minus 1. Is somebody asking a question? No, not yet. Um, and then one more thing, which is that if I'm sitting at site 2, so in a single time step, I can either hop to 1 or I can hop to 3. And for reasons of convenience, but it doesn't really matter any, at all, I'm just going to say, well, one half of the probability went this way, one half that way, so this equation should be multiplied by an overall factor of one half. Yep. Okay. Okay, very good. Let me try that. That's very unnatural for me. Anyways, uh, similarly, P2 of n just by cyclic permutations, I'll have one half uh, P3 of n minus 1 plus P1 of n minus 1. And P3 of n is equal to one half P1 of n minus 1 plus P2 of n minus 1. And I also need an initial condition. Initial and, condition. and again, let me choose the initial condition that P1 at the start of the process at, at n equals 0 is equal to, or Pi, the probability being site i when I start the system is going to be a particle sitting at site one. Uh, so again, I, I forgot to mention this earlier on. This symbol is the Kronecker delta function, which is one if i equals one and it's equal to zero otherwise. And it just is a shorthand for writing uh, that initial condition. Okay, so notice the difference between the master equations that I unfortunately just erased because they were differential equations. These are difference equations. And again, Difference equations are simpler conceptually because you kind of see them in the grade school, but they're harder to deal with to actually solve them. And so, like, how do we solve uh, this set of um, uh, difference equations? And so I'm going to introduce something called uh, the generating function. And it's exactly the analog of the Laplace transform. Um, so let me define p i of z is equal to summation from n equals um, zero to infinity of p i of n z to the power n. And so at least this time I didn't have to erase this first. So you see that it looks somewhat similar to the Laplace transform. Instead of having a continuum integral, one has a discrete sum. The argument t, 
well, here, instead of writing e to the, I mean, you can think of z as e to the minus s, and then this would be exactly the same, except just a discrete sum versus um, a continuous integral. But it turns out to be more convenient to write it this way. So now that you see that the generating function conceptually looks identical to the Laplace transform, I now need to erase this so I have some room to work. And the idea here is the same as before, is that I take these equations, every single one of them, I multiply by power z to the power n, and I make a summation. I hope you can see what's going to happen here on the left. I'm going to sum this equation, um, and I'm going to sum from n equals 1, not 0, to infinity. And I do this for all these three equations. And let's see what happens when, when we do that. And just as before, what we're going to see is that we're going to transform a set of difference equations into a set of just algebraic equations that can be solved uh, right away. So let's look over here. So uh, the first thing here, we have pi of n, z to the power n, summation from 1 to infinity. But the generating function was summed from 0 to infinity. So the left-hand side is nothing more than the generating function minus the n equals 0 term. So we're going to have on the first equation, we'll have pi of uh, p1 of z minus p1 at n equals 0. But this term, we already know what it is. It's equal to 1. And then on the right-hand side, we have 1 half. So we have zn p2 of n minus 1, z to the n minus 1. And what we can do is we can factor out an overall factor of z factor it out, and then there's overall factor of 2, and then I'm left with p2 of n minus 1, z to the n minus 1, summed from n equals 1 to infinity, which is the same as if shifting the index, we can say it's the same as summing p2 of n, z to the n from 0 to infinity, and so this is nothing more than the generating function again. So we're just going to get p2 of z plus p3 of z. And then there's plus cyclic permutation, so we're going to have uh, P2 of z minus the initial condition, but we started with the particle at site 1, so there's no initial condition for, for 2, and so this is, we don't need anything here, so we're going to get z over 2, uh, P2, P3 plus P1, and again, I'm being lazy, not writing the arguments, and P3 of z is equal to z over 2, P1 plus P2. Now, this is where it's very difficult for me to actually do this in real time on the blackboard, but as a simple exercise, one can solve these three uh, algebraic equations. And let me write down what the answer is. One gets P1 of z is equal to uh, 1 minus z over 2. 1 minus z. 1 plus z over 2. And P2 equals P3, and that's equal to uh, z over 2, 1 minus z, 1 plus z over 2. So unfortunately, um, because the Laplace transform is erased, you can't see that this looks exactly the same in form to that of the Laplace transforms. But let's try and extract some useful information from this. Uh, without doing any calculation, because ultimately what we want to do is we want to invert these generating functions and compute pi of n. But let's see what we can learn without doing any work first. So um, the first point to make is that we saw that in the Laplace transform, the limit s going to 0 correspond to the long time limit. So here, what we're interested in is the large n limit, many steps. What is the form of the probability distribution after many steps? And just as uh, S, you know, t going to infinity correspond to s going to 0. Here, n going to infinity corresponds to z going to 1. So there is this correspondence. n going to infinity, I'm um, sorry, n going to infinity in real time is the same as z going to 1. And one can see if one looks at the Laplace transform domain, one saw that t going to infinity was like s going to 0, but e to the s goes to 1 as s goes to 0. So that's why z, which is e to the s, so if s went to 0, if z is going to 1. So if we look at the s, the z going to 1 limit of these functions, 
we can learn something about the long time limit. So let's do the same text things that we did uh, for the uh, discrete continuous case, let's look at the summation pi of z. So if we add up p1 plus p2 plus p3 in the numerator of 1 minus z over 2 plus z over 2 plus z over 2, so we get 1 plus z over 2 which cancels this and we just get 1 over 1 minus z. And if you expand this in a power series in z, this is nothing more than 1 plus z plus z squared plus z cubed and the crucial point is that the coefficient in front of z is equal to 1. So it says that at any end, the total probability being at any site is always equal to 1. So we just have conservation of probability. And now let's look at the z going to 1 limit over here. Well, um, one sees that when z goes to 1, this is blowing up, but this sort of contains the asymptotic behavior and for everything else, we can just say, well, let's just plug in z equals 1. So we have 1 half, and here we have 1 half divided by 3 halves. So this is 1 third. So for example, as z goes to 1, uh, p2 of z goes to 1 third times 1 over 1 minus z. And if we were to expand this in a power series, well, this is trivial to expand in a power series, we see that the coefficient is 1 third. So it shows that in the long time limit, the probability of being at site 2 goes to 1 third. So we start with the particle at site 1, then because of the mixing of this discrete random walk, ultimately it's going to go to um, um, 1 third. But now to invert the uh, generating function is in general, it's a little bit more involved than uh, the Laplace, uh, inverting the Laplace transform. And let me just sort of tell you how to do it formally. But this example is so simple that we don't have to do all the formal tricks. But the point is that uh, this is a power, you know, now I treat z as like a complex variable and I say, well, this is a power series in z. But if I then take, if I want to compute, say, the nth term in the power series representation in this, the way that I do this, so let me write to compute nth term. I take my generating function, pi of z, I divide by z to the power n plus 1. If I do that, then on the right hand side, now it's a power series with negative powers of z in it, which is called the Laurent series. And what we want, if I multiply by z to the power n minus 1, is that the coefficient of 1 over z will be the nth term in the original Taylor series. So to extract this nth term in the Taylor series, you take pi of z, divide by z to the n plus 1, perform a contour integral around the origin times 1 over 2 pi i, and then the coefficient pi of n is just the residue of this integral, um, and so this is equal to pi of n. So that's the formal way one should, do, one should um, invert the uh, generating function. But it turns out again that things here are sufficiently simple that we don't have to worry with all that uh, in this particular case because we, again we can do a partial fraction decomposition of say let's look at this guy over here um, and so um, I can write this and so there's a z over 2 sitting out in front um, but let's see, let, let me, I have to fiddle for, for a moment so 1 minus z, 1 plus z over 2 uh, and if I do, um, so 2 minus sign, and um, so if I put this, I get 1 minus z over 2, uh, so I want to, Sorry, I'm, gonna, I, I'm not going to do it in my head. I'm going to look at my, I'm going to cheat and look at my notes because I can't remember. Um, anyways, yeah. So this turns out to be, if I do this two-thirds and one-third. So you take two-thirds of this and one-third of that. You do, you, you, you know, you put this over here, this over here, and do this algebra. You're going to get the same thing as over here. But the point about this is that the Taylor series expansion of just a simple pole is trivial. And so this thing is equal to z over 2 times uh, 2 thirds, and then I have 1 plus z plus z squared plus dot 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 minus 1 third, and then I have 1 minus z over 2 plus
plus z over 2 squared plus dot dot dot. And from this, you can then compute pi of n as the nth term in the power series representation of this function. And so I'm now I'm skipping to a trivial step, which is to extract that. But what you'll find, for example, is p2 of n is equal to the following series. It starts off 0 at, at, the, at the start, and then 1 half, and then it's, it's um, 3 eighths, and then the next term is 5 sixteenths, and so on down the road. And as n goes to infinity, this converges to the value 1 third. So more or less line by line, everything in the generating function solution is the same as in the original um, Laplace transform solution. But I wanted to show these examples side by side because it's a, just a useful pedagogical exercise. Uh, sorry, a, a comment on like the, the writing on the blackboard? Yes. The car is kind of blurry. So little things like i's and pluses and minuses, if you maybe could uh, okay. pay I'm, attention or make them a little bit bigger, uh, okay. it would help. Okay, I, I'll try, and hopefully by tomorrow we'll have a better camera. But um, yes, yes, but yes. you know, but also feel free to interrupt if something is too small. Just say it's too small. Don't you know? Yeah. Don't have yeah, to wait yeah. to the end. Okay, thanks. Okay, all right. So, uh, anyways, that is the story about random walks on small graphs. But what I want to turn my attention now to is the class of random uh, class of hopping prop, prop, hopping prop problems known as just the one D random walk. And so some of the things I'm going to show you now perhaps are familiar to some of you, and hopefully though some things will be brand new. And I want to uh, describe again uh, using things like the generating function and, and Laplace transforms how to look at 1D random walks in a very unified uh, framework. So let's now talk about um, 1D random walks. So in the most general case, what I have is a bunch of points that are along an infinite one-dimensional line. And there's, at site n, there's a hopping rate, r sub n, going to the right, and a hopping rate, l sub n, going to the left. And what I'm interested in is pn at time t, the probability that I'm at site n at time t. And um, again, uh, maybe I'll write it capitalized. And the master equation tells me how this probability changes as a function of time. And for this one-dimensional hopping process, in general, there's uh, two ways that you know, this pn can change. You can either have hopping into site n or hopping away from site n. And hopping in, well, I could be at n minus 1, and I hop to the right. So there's a term rn minus 1, pn minus 1. I could be uh, one step to the right at n plus 1 and hop to the left, so plus ln plus 1, pn minus 1. And then I could be at n and then I hop out and I can hop with rates ln plus rn as a total hopping rate out. So there's minus rn plus ln, rn plus ln, pn. So that is the most general uh, master equation. And now let's work out some uh, very specific examples. So the most simple example I can think of is the so-called Poisson process. And in the Poisson process, we say there's no hopping to the left, so ln is equal to 0. And uh, all the hopping rates to the right are all equal to the same. And one last thing is that I will also assume that I start at n equals 0, and I chop the system there. So I start at the, at the left end of the system, and it's only going to hop to the right. I don't have to worry about the negative uh, axis at all. So let's study this. And you know, this is a classic process you first get in the first course in probability theory, but let's just write it out. So p0 dot. So that means that I can't hop from, my, from negative axis, so this, this term doesn't appear. And, um, and there's no ln, and so there's just minus rp0. Because if I'm sitting at site 0, so I'm sitting at the end of my system, all that can happen is I can hop to the right. There's no way I can gain probability, so there's only the loss term. So minus. And then I can write p1 dot is equal to, um, so I'm going to have um, rp0 
minus P1. And P2 dot is equal to R P1 minus P2 dot, 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 dot. So there's two ways one can solve this. One can um, just solve it, one, you can solve these equations one by one. Clearly the equation for P0 is going to be P0 of T is equal to E to the minus RT. One can then plug that into here and now one has a solvable equation for P1 and then plug this into here and get a solvable equation for P2 and so on. And so one by one you can develop the solution to this. Um, let me do a, a slightly different way by introducing the Laplace transform, but I leave it as a simple exercise for any student to just solve these one by one and get the solution. But the Laplace transform solution So again, I define the Laplace transform Pn of s is equal to integral e to the minus st Pn of t dt. So if you plug that into these equations, again, um, they change into just purely algebraic equations. And I realized I forgot one thing when I was talking about the Poisson process. I need to define an initial condition. Where did the particle start? And the simplest case, the natural case, is you start at n equals zero. So Pn at t equals zero is equal to delta n zero. So I'm starting the particle at the origin. So if again you do the Laplace transform method, then you transform these differential equations to algebraic equations. So time derivative is sp naught minus the initial condition, which is one, is equal to minus r p naught. So this is pretty easy. Even I can solve this. It says that p naught is equal to one over s plus r which tells us that P0 of t is equal to e to the minus rt, which also you could have gotten, that's what's over here. But let's look at, continue this game again. So we're going to get sp1 is equal to rp0 um, minus rp1. So I get from this that p1 is equal to r over s plus r p0 and so that's equal to r over s plus r squared. So that's simple. And now if I do what p2 is, well, I look at this equation and I'm going to get um, r p1 times s divided by s plus r. So I'm going to get r squared divided by s plus r cubed, dot, 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 dot. So in, at least algebraically, the, in, the Laplace transform, you can sort of guess the solution. You can see the solution without doing a heck of a lot of work. And now we have to invert this Laplace transform. And again, this is one of the first lessons in Laplace, tron, Laplace transform technology. What is the inverse Laplace transform of this? So I'm not going to tell you how to do that. I'm going to leave that as something for you to uh, think about. But the answer is the following. Pn of t is equal to e to the minus rt, um, um, rt to the power n divided by n factorial. So this is the Poisson distribution, the very famous Poisson distribution. And um, the main points of this is that the average position of the particle, if I look at what is n average, which is nothing more than the summation over all n, n, p n of t, you know, from n equals zero to infinity, where is the average position of the particle this is just growing like RT. And it just stands to reason because if I'm hopping to the right at a rate R after time T, I've done RT steps to the right and so I should be at RT. And a, a nice feature about the Poisson distribution that in the limit of N goes to infinity, this goes over into a Gaussian distribution whose mean value is RT and whose width is growing like the square root of RT. Okay, so that is, um, I guess, more or less everything I wanted to say about the Poisson distribution. Here's what I'd say, any questions? I look over this empty room with three people who are now getting infected by me. Um, okay. So let me now turn to uh, the classic nearest neighbor random walk. So presumably all of you have seen this in the context of discrete time discrete space, and what I want to show you is how you solve this in continuous time. So uh, I'm going to erase this with regret once again. <clears throat> so
So let's now do um, the nearest neighbor random walk. So I'm assuming here that I have an infinite one-dimensional line. There's no longer n equals zero as a constraint. So n, n plus one, n minus one. And the hopping rates are the same everywhere. And so my equation of motion, p n dot, is equal to uh, p n minus one. So I can hop from n minus one to n with the rate one. I can hop from n plus one to n with the rate one. And then if I'm at n, I can hop either to the right or left, each with rate one. So there's a minus two p n. So this is the equation I want to solve. Um, <clears throat> and again, uh, I'm going to assume that uh, p n uh, t equals zero, in this case, is equal to delta n zero. So I start with a particle at the origin. I want to ask, how does the probability distribution evolve in time? We know that in discrete time, discrete space, it's just the binomial distribution. We know that in the continuous limit, it becomes the Gaussian distribution. But let's actually do uh, an explicit calculation to see how that all comes about. So in this case, I'm going to use the Fourier transform method. And in fact, I'm going to solve this example in two different ways. Uh, first by Laplace, I mean, first by Fourier transform and then by Laplace transform. So let me now introduce the Fourier transform, P n of k, uh, whoops, P k of t, sorry, P k of t. And this is equal to the summation from n equals minus infinity to plus infinity, P uh, n of t, e to the i k n. So hopefully uh, the Fourier transform is something most, is generally more familiar to everyone. But uh, the point is that by introducing this Fourier transform, if you take this equation and multiply by e to the i k n and sum from minus infinity to plus infinity, well on the left hand side you just get the time derivative of the Fourier transform. For example, here you have p n minus one e to the i k n, but you can change this to e to the i k n minus one times e to the i k, and the e to the i k n minus one p n minus one summed over all n is just the Fourier transform again, just multiplied by a phase factor. So once again, the point of doing these spectral analyses is that you transform a difference equation into an algebraic equation, which is easily solved. So if I do this Fourier transform, I'm going to get on the left-hand side p k of t dot. And here I'm going to get p n minus 1, e to the i k n minus 1 with an extra factor of e to the i k. So it's e to the i k. Here I'll get plus e to the minus i k minus 2 p k of t. And this I can write as uh, 2 cosine k minus 1 p k of t. Two should go right? Oh, sorry, thank you. Two should go outside, correct. Okay, and so you see that I've transformed a, you know, difference differential equation into nothing more than a simple differential equation whose solution is simple. Uh, so this is p k of t is equal to p k at t equals zero e to the two cos k minus one t. Now, what is pk at t equals zero? So here is my initial condition. If I Fourier transform this, take this, multiply by e to the i k n and summed over all n, there's only one term in the series when n is equal to zero. e to the i k zero is one. So this object is just one. So that is the solution in the, in the Fourier domain. Now in this case, it's somewhat more advanced, and uh, I don't expect anyone to know this, but it turns out that this uh, Fourier representation, you can invert it, but it's not inverted by any elementary means, so I'm just going to tell you what the answer is. It turns out that P n of t, what you see here is e to the minus 2t, and then you have e to the 2 cos kt. And if you expand that in a power series, it involves the Bessel functions, and so the answer is I n of 2t e to the minus 2t. 
So this requires a little bit more work to actually show this, but if you look in Abramowitz and Stegen, that beautiful blue book that you young people who aren't in this room with me now uh, probably don't know about, but us old farts, we all have our dog-eared copies of Abramowitz and Stegen, and we, we love this book because it tells us so many useful things, and one of them is the fact that this, uh, the, you know, the inverse of the Fourier transform of this is this thing, and here I n 2 t is the modified Bessel function of the second kind of order n. And um, the thing is that now it takes a even more work to then look at what is the asymptotic behavior of this function. And it turns out then the limit, t going to infinity, n going to infinity, such that n squared over t is, is, is finite and not blowing up or not going to zero. In this limit, uh, this thing is just the good old Gaussian distribution. So this turns out to be equal to 1 over 4 pi t square root e to the minus n squared over 4 t. So this is the good old Gaussian that probably you're all familiar with, but you're seeing it derived in kind of a crazy way. Okay. So um, let me now solve exactly the same problem Again, because I want to use this as sort of a warm-up for the techniques I'll use throughout this set of lectures, let me solve exactly the same problem using the Laplace transform method. So again, with great regret, I'm going to erase this because you know I'd like to do it side by side, um, but let's. Let, I have to do it, so please excuse sorry, me. Sorry, what yeah. is? Uh, I'm sorry. Yo, go ahead. Ask. What is the uh, justification of uh, n square over t uh, being finite in the... Well, no, the it's just, so that's, that's sort of like, if I was giving a course in mathematical physics, then I would show you how to take the limit of, the, you know, the Bessel function is a, a special function of mathematical physics. It has interesting asymptotic properties for large n, large t, small n, small t. <clears throat> and it just turns out that in this particular limit, and only in this particular limit, this goes into just the Gaussian distribution. So I haven't shown it to you, uh, and if I had another lecture, I would show it to you. Okay, so, thanks. So sorry for the non-answer. Okay, anyways. Um, so let's now solve it by the uh, Laplace transform method. So our equation was again, so I guess I don't need to have the picture anymore. So we have, uh, Pn dot is equal to Pn minus 1 plus Pn plus 1 minus 2Pn. So I want to do, now do the Laplace transform solution. So what I do again is I take this equation, multiply by e to the minus st, integrate from 0 to infinity dt, and let's see what comes out. So we're going to get um, S P N minus P N at T equals zero. So I'm putting here the argument so we, we know that we're talking about uh, the zero time behavior of the original function. And then we're going to have here uh, P N minus one plus P N plus one minus two P N. So it's only for N equals zero that we have a special term. So we're going to have for N equals zero we have S P zero minus one is equal to P minus one plus P one minus two P N minus two P zero. Um, and again, if we start with a particle at the origin, clearly the probability distribution is symmetrical. So P one and P minus one are the same. So this just goes over into two P one minus P zero. So this is true for N equals zero. For N not equal to zero, we're just going to have S, and allow me now to put the minus 2, let me put it over here. So let's write it S plus 2 Pn is equal to uh, Pn minus 1 plus Pn plus 1. So once again, we've transformed a system of a differential difference equation into just a difference equation, which we can solve. And to make this simpler, let me write this as Pn is equal to 1 over S plus 2, Pn minus 1 plus Pn plus 1. And I'll define this thing to be A, some constant A, Pn minus 1 plus Pn plus 1. 
So it's a two-term recurrence relation. And by the way, if uh, what I'm showing you here, the technique is just, you could also use this to solve something like the Fibonacci sequence. You can use it, uh, solve it by this technique. So how do we solve this equation? It's a second order difference equation, linear difference equation. And the calculus of differences is just the same as the calculus of differential equations, only clunkier. So we just assume an exponential solution, just as you do for second order differential equation. Let's assume that Pn is, which is a function of s, is just some thing lambda to the s, where we don't know what lambda is, but we're going to figure it out. So if we plug it into here and, 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 and substitute, we're going to get uh, lambda to the, uh, sorry, lambda to the n. Sorry for my dyslexia. Okay, so, uh, and so this lambda will be some function of s. Anyway, so we're going to get lambda to the power n is equal to a um, lambda to the n minus 1 plus lambda to the n plus 1. And so let's factor out a common factor lambda to the n minus 1. And so we're going to get, uh, um, we're going to get a lambda squared minus lambda plus a is equal to 0. And so uh, there are two solutions because this is a second order equation that there should be two linearly independent solutions. There are two solutions, lambda plus minus, solving the quadratic. And so I'm going to get uh, minus, so I'm going to get 1 over 2a plus or minus um, uh, 1 over 4a squared minus 1. So we're almost done because now we know what this, you know, what, how, how this thing depends on n. Notice that this is an exponential solution on n. And what, in order to fix things, we have to, um, oh, I should have, I, I forgot one small thing here is that, <clears throat> let me just make this look nicer. We have a linear equation, so we don't know the amplitude. So I need to put here some amplitude. I don't know what it is yet. We'll figure it out. But the point is that the amplitude doesn't appear here, so we don't have to worry about it. <clears throat> one more thing is that if you look here, this function a is 1 over s plus 2. s goes between 0 and infinity, which says that, s, that if s goes between 0 and infinity, then a goes between um, 0. So it goes between 1 half and 0. And you can see right away that here, lambda plus is bigger than 1, and lambda minus is less than 1. Lambda plus bigger than 1 is a bad solution because it blows up exponentially. We know that the probability has to be uh, less than 1 altogether. So we have, to, we have to reject the solution. So in principle, we have two linearly independent solutions, a lambda plus of n plus b lambda minus of n, but there's only one solution. Pn of s is a lambda minus of n. And the way that we figure that out, what, what A is, is by plugging it into the one boundary condition or, or special equation, which is different than everybody else, this equation here. So um, uh, we determine A by plugging into this equation. So we have um, S P0, but P0 is just A minus 1 is equal to 2 p1 minus p0, but p1 is a lambda minus, uh, minus p0, which we said was just a. So we can now solve for a. So again, because I'm really bad at doing sort of really simple algebra on the blackboard, I'm just going to now cheat and tell you what the answer is here. a, and you can check that I did it correctly, a is equal to 1 over s plus 2 minus 2 lambda minus. OK. So we've now solved the problem in the Laplace domain. But you, know, you might say, well, what does this look like? You know, where can we graph this function? And um, in general, for arbitrary s, it's not necessarily very easy. But what we're, again, what we're interested in is a limit of long time, which corresponds to the s going to zero limit of the um, of the Laplace transform. So let let's look. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Please, uh, can you just remember what is p minus one? What is p minus one? 
Yes. Where, where, where's the, where, which equation are we talking when about? When you take n equal to zero, s, p, oh, zero. Oh, minus yeah, yeah. No, but the point is that I start with a particle at the origin. And so clearly, if I start with a particle at the origin, the probability distribution is spreading symmetrically. So p minus one or p minus n for any n is the same as p plus sub n. So that's p minus one is the same as p one. So this guy is equal to that guy. Okay. Okay. All right, so again, we have to look at the limit s going to zero. And, you know, this is one of these things where if you're not used to this sort of asymptotic analysis, it can seem like you're standing on quicksand. But once you get used to it, it turns out to always be the easiest way of getting uh, asymptotic information. So we want, it where it, we want the s going to zero limit because that's going to tell us everything we want to know about the large n limit of the probability distribution. So let's figure out what the uh, s going to zero limit is. So first of all, um, again, a was equal to one over uh, s plus two. So as s goes to zero, this is one half, and I can write this as one over one plus s over two. Um, and then for, loss, for small s, this is one half, one minus s over two. And again, you know, you might say, well, don't I have to keep more terms? But if we're interested in the long time limit, we don't need to worry about additional terms. So it's only the first term that's relevant. Okay, so that's what A is. And um, 1 over 2A is, uh, so, so that's, yeah, 1 over 2A. So 2A will be, this is just equal to, approximately equal to 1 plus S over 2. So, for example, lambda minus is equal to 2a, so that's 1 plus s over 2. And then I have minus a square root, and then I have 1 plus s over 2 minus 1, so that's just s over 2. Um, <clears throat> I'm a little bothered because I remember there's no 2 here. Let me just check my notes on this one. Four a squared. Oh, I, I see what's wrong. So, sorry. Let me just go back here. So, I want I want this thing squared inside the square root. So, when I square this, so let me put it here. One over two a all squared. So, when I square this, I'm just going to get one plus s. So, I plug that in here. So, I have one plus s minus one. So, this is just root s. So, it's even simpler. But again, asymptotically, Square root of s is much bigger than s over 2 when s goes to 0, so I don't have to worry about this term. So this is roughly 1 minus the square root of s. Okay, and so now I think, and let's see what a is. So a is equal to 1 over 2 plus s minus 2 lambda, so that's 2 plus root s. So these cancel. Um, and again, I can forget about this compared to root s, and so this is just equal to 1 over root s. So finally, I get that Pn of s, which is equal to a lambda minus to the power n. So this asymptotically goes like 1 over the square root of s, and lambda was um, 1 minus root s to the power n, which I can write as 1 over the square root of s, e to the minus n root s. And now if you look at your, your handy dandy table of inverse Laplace transforms, the inverse Laplace transform of this is very simple. So now I have Pn of t, which is the inverse Laplace transform of this. This is nothing more than 1 over 4 pi t e to the minus um, n squared divided by 4 pi t. 4 pi t. So here's the Gaussian distribution uh, now derived in a very sort of unconventional fashion. Anyways, the point of this discussion was just to give you a feeling for how you can use the Laplace transform, the generating function, to solve very simple problems in a very clean way. And you can hopefully see the unity of the different methods of solution. And um, we will be using these techniques throughout the, the class. Yes. Um, I'm, yeah, so I, here I, students, are you tired? Do you need a five minute break? We have 
think it's fine. What? We're okay. Yeah, I think it's You're, fine. Uh, keep going? Keep on if you, yeah. Yeah, okay. I'll keep going. Not a problem. Okay. So um, what I want to do now is... Um, where's my notes? Which is my notes? Oh, yeah. So um, I want to now do an interlude here. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Um, yeah. About the computation of capital A in the denominator, don't you have a two square root of s, maybe? Because the expression was one over s plus two minus two lambda minus, right? Say it again. One over. Uh, let me just let me. So A was. Uh, yeah. Here's where lack of blackboard space really kills me. Minus two yeah. lambda minus. Correct. That's what it was. Yes. Ask away. Yeah, question? Maybe there was a two, two square root of s in the expression to the left you wrote? The expression to the left. You wrote two plus s minus two plus the expression for capital A. Yeah, so I just wrote it here. Yeah, on the left you wrote, you wrote, uh, where you cancel a bunch of stuff. Here. Yeah, there was two plus s. Right. Then uh, you had uh, minus 2 plus 2 square root of s, maybe? Uh, so when the square root s there should be a 2 square root of s. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. 2 square root of s. Sorry. So this is 2 square root of s. 2 square root of s. And then that's fine. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Okay, so I want to do a little interlude. Um, uh, this is just a, a small thing about random walks, which some of you may be aware of and some of you may not, but it's just, it's a very beautiful result. Um, let me now, because uh, this was all based on a hopping rate of one. In general, one thinks about a continuum diffusion equation in which one is solving <coughs> uh, dp dt is equal to d d second p by the x squared. That would be start, this is the continuum version of what I just solved, where d is called the diffusion coefficient, and it measures the rate at which uh, the random walk or the diffusing particle spreads. And for a delta function initial condition, the solution to this is p x of t is equal to 1 over 4 pi dt now, e to the minus x squared over 4 dt. And um, I want to just tell you some amazing properties of this very simple innocuous function that uh, go under the uh, general term of first passage processes. So let's look at this solution. So this is the solution of a random walk that's spreading in an infinite one-dimensional space. But let's ask the following question. We start on a semi-infinite line. We start at some position x naught. We release our particles. They're going to make a Gaussian probability distribution that's gradually spreading out. But at x equals 0, there is a cliff. And if a random walker hits the cliff, he falls off and dies and he's gone forever. And the question I want to ask is, what is the probability that the random walker that starts here is going to die? If I wait forever, what is the probability he's going to die? And if he does die, how long does it take for him to die? So these two questions go under the term of first passage processes. And it turns out one can understand this with a beautiful solution that comes from elementary electrostatics because what we want to solve now is the diffusion equation in a semi-infinite interval. This is the solution in the infinite interval with no boundary conditions. So how do we solve the problem here? And so the problem that we want to solve, again, is uh, we want to solve pt is equal to dpxx. So here, uh, subscripts mean partial differentiation. p at x... Um, x at t equals 0 is equal to delta of x minus x naught. We start with the particle at x naught. And we want to impose the boundary condition that p of 0 and any t is equal to 0. That is, if I hit the cliff, by definition, I die, and then I'm not part of the probability distribution anymore. And that can be imposed by saying that the concentration at the origin is 0. So how do we solve this problem? So let me write down the answer, and the answer turns out to be very beautiful and very simple. Well, 
we start with a particle at x naught, so let's first include that contribution, 1 over 4 pi dt, e to the minus x minus x naught squared over 4 dt. So that would be if there was no boundary condition here. We're starting now at x naught, not at, this is for starting at the origin, this is for starting at x naught. And now we need to do something to satisfy the boundary condition. And again, in, for those of you who have taken a course in electrostatics, you know that if you have like a grounded plane, you put a point charge of a grounded plane, there's an image charge is coming up because the system is grounded. And this can be uh, essentially reproduced by putting an image charge of exactly the same magnitude of opposite sign at symmetrical location. So all we need to do to satisfy the boundary condition is put an anti-Gaussian at minus x naught, whose amplitude is the same as the Gaussian. And then the Gaussian and anti-Gaussian conspire symmetrically to ensure that the concentration at x equals zero is always equal to zero. So if I put here minus, because it's an anti-Gaussian, e to the minus x plus x naught squared over 4 dt, that's the answer. So very little work. Um, if you want to be a masochist about it, you can actually solve it directly by the Laplace transform method. And I encourage you, if you want to see it, try it by the Laplace transform method. Just solve formally the differential equation and you'll find that you get this answer. But now what I really want is something I'll call fxt, which is the probability of first hitting origin at time t. So by construction, since if, if you fall, if you hit the cliff, you fall off and die, so anything that gets here... No, this, uh, I was, thank you, so, thank you, f x naught. So this is the problem, first hitting the origin of time t, starting, thank you for the question, starting at x naught. And first of all, how do you compute this probability of hitting? Well, this is just the sort of random walkers that are falling off the cliff. So it's nothing more than the diffusive flux uh, over the cliff. So this is nothing more than d dp by dx. This is the diffusive flux at x equals zero. So I'm not going to go through like the uh, sort of boring details of just differentiating this thing with respect to x and computing and evaluating x equals zero. It's simple to calculate and it turns out to be a very beautiful answer. One over four pi dt cubed e to the minus x naught squared over four dt. So this object is called the first passage probability and um, if you stare at this thing, you'll notice it has a number of very amazing features. First point is that uh, as t goes to infinity, this goes to one, and so there's a t to the minus three halves tail. So it means that uh, there's a very long time tail of straggling random walks that are falling to their deaths, but they're falling at very long times. So in fact, there are two important properties. Here's important property one. The integral from zero to infinity, dt, the time integral of the first passage probability, f x naught t. What is this quantity? This is the fraction of random walkers that fall off the cliff. How many random walkers, or what fraction of them fall off the cliff? And an amazing result is that this is equal to one. All walkers are sure to die. No matter how, you know, if you wait forever, everybody dies. So it's, uh, that property is called recurrence. But the second property is that if I say, how long does it take to die? So if I look at the integral dt, t, the average time to fall off the cliff, and since this is now a properly normalized probability distribution, I don't have to divide by anything, this function is equal to infinity. So even though you're sure to die, it takes infinitely long time to die, and the reason why it's infinity is because we're integrating at long times dt, t divided by t to three halves, which is certainly, from scaling perspective, diverges. So uh, this dichotomy between you're sure to die, but it takes infinitely long to die, is what makes random walks still a very vital field, even after 140 years of serious effort. This dichotomy underlies all kinds of strange properties of 1D diffusion that are still unknown even as of today. 
Okay, so I do have more to present, so, uh, but I, sh I should stop at 12.30? Uh, more or less? Uh, yeah, I think, uh, or 12.35? 12 so okay. Uh, uh, PM. How, how are the students going to eat lunch if we can't gather? How are we going to eat lunch if we can't gather? Okay. Are we going to be delivered food to our rooms? With guys in hazmat suits? Then I'm dead because I'm a vegetarian. Ah, yeah. There is some grass around me. <laughs> I can graze the grass. Okay. So um, I'm going to spend, you know, I'm not going to finish this topic yet, but I want to introduce to you some, a very beautiful uh, type of random walk known as the birth-death process. And part of the reason for introducing this is that, first of all, uh, or introducing right at the start, is that the birth-death process can be thought of as a one-dimensional random walk process, but as you're going to see, it underlies so many non-equilibrium processes, it's just everywhere in biological physics. It's, it's worth knowing about. So here is the birth-death process. You have organisms, like bacteria, and they give birth to their children at some rate. And let's call that rate one, just to make life simple. And then they also die at some, some rate. So um, let's call P, N of T, the probability that there exists N organisms at time T. And let's write down the master equation for the evolution of the number of part for this Pn of t. So Pn dot. How does this change? Well, if I have n minus 1 organisms and one of them gives birth, that means that then there'll be n. And so that increases the probability of there n particles in the system. But since every organism gives birth at the same rate, the collective rate of giving birth is equal to n minus 1. So there's a term here, n minus 1, p n minus 1. But it also is possible that you have n plus 1 organisms, and one of them happens to die. And they, if they die at the same rate as they give birth, then the total collective rate of death is n plus 1, so plus n plus 1, p n plus 1. And then, if I have n particles in the system, any one of them could give birth, or it could die. So the rate of birth is 1, the rate of death is 1, and so the total rate of one organism doing something is 2, and there's 2, and there's n particles, so the total rate of anything happening is 2n pn. So this is the master equation for the birth-death process in a limit where the birth rate and the death rate are the same. Now you might ask, well, what happens if the death rate is bigger than the birth rate or vice versa? Well, if the birth rate is bigger than the death rate, then the system explodes exponentially, and that is not terribly relevant because we don't have, we're not completely engulfed with bacteria. Uh, if the death rate wins out over the birth rate, then the particles die out, and then there's nothing left to talk about. So this turns out to be the interesting limit. Now, another perspective that you can look at this thing is, is that this is nothing more than a diffusion-like process, except that if you're at site N, it's like things are moving faster and faster. So it's like a spatially dependent random walk process that becomes, the random walk becomes jumpier and jumpier as you go further and further to the right. And once again, this problem is only defined on the semi-infinite interval. I should start with, you know, if I start with no particles, nothing's going to happen because if there's no particles, uh, nothing, you can't give birth if you're already dead. So you should start, with the natural initial condition is starting with one particle. So let's do Pn of t equals 0 is equal to delta n1. So I start here and so way out here the hopping rate is huge so let me draw this with a really big arrow whereas over here the hopping rate is kind of small. And now we want to solve for the probability distribution of this random walk. And well how do we do it? <coughs> so once again, um, you know, there's lots of sort of baby steps you can take before you try and solve for the whole thing. One thing that you might want to try, and in general, whenever you're faced with solving a master equation, 
and you don't know how to proceed, you might say, well, I don't know how to solve the, the full master equation, but why not look at some moment of the distribution? You know, so as an exercise, you could try solving for n average dot. And so this will be nothing more than the summation n p of n, uh, summation n equals 1 to infinity um, dot. So one could attempt to look at something like this. But let's, let's see what would happen if I were to solve, say, for the first moment of the probability distribution. Well, the problem is that this is a symmetrical hopping process. So if I'm at any point n, the rate of giving birth, the rate of giving death, and the rate of dying are the same. So clearly, the average n does not change. So this provides you no information. So the, then you might try looking at something like n squared, n squared. And in fact, here you will get useful information. So if you want to feel like you're intimidated by this equation and you don't know how to solve it, um, you could try looking at moments and you'll get something. So uh, once again, it's like, uh, you know, I would give this as an exercise to the students. Compute this function and see what you get. But what I want to do, and I guess I'm not going to finish it now, but I'll just sort of tantalize you with sort of setting up the problem. How do we solve this differential equation? So let's just stare at this equation for a moment. And, uh, and again, I would ask students, I've spent time presenting generating function, Laplace transform, Fourier transform. How would I solve this equation? What should I do? Somebody want to shout out something from the, from the students? Generating Someone functions. Someone said generating function. You get an A. So. Let us solve by the generating function. So let me define the generating function as here, summation. So, sorry. So I'll define uh, P. Let me use the same notation as my notes because I, I just don't want to confuse myself. What did I call it in my notes? Oh, it's not even here. Um, just. Yeah, for reasons that are just historical, let me call the generating function g of z, g for generating function. This will be the summation pn of t, z to the power n. And here I have to be a little bit careful. What do I define as the lower limit? Because we see that if there's zero particles in the system, there's nothing happening. But the absorbing state where there's no particles in the system is actually dynamically interesting. So it's useful to start at n equals zero to infinity. And if you didn't know better and started n equals 1, you would find that, oh, I better need n equals 0. So if you didn't have the limits right, you would figure it out pretty quickly. So let's take this generating function, plug it into this differential equation, and let's see what we can learn from it. OK, so I take this equation and multiply by z to the power n. And let me sum from uh, 0 to infinity. So on the left-hand side, I just get the generating function itself. So I get g dot. And in fact, let me be a little bit more careful just because g is a function of z and t. And so in fact, this is the partial derivative with respect to time. Um, let's, let's do the sort of like, again, if I had more blackboard space, I'd have a workbook over here. But let's just look at one term just to give a flavor for what happens. Let's look at this thing here. Summation 2 n p n z to the power n. Summation from n equals 0 to infinity. What is this? Well, um, you know, there's, if, you, if you sort of stare at this for a second, you say, well, look, if I, multi if I do der derivative with respect to z, I would bring down the factor n, and I have z to the power n minus 1. So if I multiply by z d by dz, that reproduces everything on the right. So this thing is nothing more than twice z d by dz summation n equals 0 to infinity of p n z to the power n. And so this is nothing more than 2 z dg by dz. So that's that term. So I have here minus 2 z dg by dz. Uh, let's do another term. 
So again, maybe I will, I'll, I'll wait to the latest possible moment to erase anything. So let's look at the term uh, n plus 1, pn plus 1, z to the power n, summation n equals 0 to infinity. Uh, so what can I do with this? So let me just write this. Let's just do, this is the same as d by dz of summation p n plus 1, z to the power n plus 1, summation n equals 0 to infinity. Um, and so you see that if I take d by dz, down comes a factor n plus 1, and then I, I lose one power of n, and this is basically the generating function except for the uh, minus 1 term, but when I differentiate it, it doesn't play any role. So this is nothing more than just... Uh, Oops, is this right? Um, sorry, um, let me just be 100% sure before I make a fool of myself. Uh, uh, D by DC, it looks right. I'm, I'm, a little, I'm a little suspicious right here. I, I'm, I'm not sure of myself, but let me, let me just leave it for the moment because I'll do the other term and then I'll know for sure. So then I have another term here, n minus 1, p n minus 1 times uh, z to the power n. And this is going from, uh, oh, and by the way, notice that here, when I sum from n equals 0, it looks like there's an equation for p minus 1 because there's an n equals 0 here in this p minus 1. But if I have minus 1 particles, you can't give birth. So in fact, this term does not start at n equals 0, even though I'm summing from n equals 0 to infinity. The very first equation has this term absent. So this equation, even though it seems like it starts at n equals 0, actually starts at n equals 1 to infinity. And so it's this. And so let's see what we can do with this. Um, yeah, I, I feel like I've done something really stupid, but I'm not sure what I've done. What? What? The one above, probably. Is, uh, yeah, the one above. This one. No, the one below. Yeah. This one you have to, to, to shift n into n minus 1. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, yes. Sorry. You solved my problem for me. So, yeah, so I, the thing is that. This object here is not quite the generating function because it's, it's got this extra one here. So all you do is you shift the index. You say, let me define a new index, m, which is n plus 1, of p, m, z to the m, summation from m equals 1 to infinity. And, uh, but then the, I can put in the zero term because that disappears when I differentiate because it doesn't depend on z. And so this just becomes, um, uh, yeah, so this is nothing more than, Sorry. Uh, I think, uh, so the, the starting equation, the one uh, which on, the, on the right. Here. The, the one. Yes. So I think uh, uh, this is not true for n equal to zero. That's correct. That is so you should sum from n equal to one. Well, or, or I could just say that when I sum from n equal zero, I just don't include this term. Okay. Yeah. Then, uh, and, and then everything else is okay. Also, what? Uh, This term, n equals zero. N equals zero won't c contribute because n is equal to zero, so it doesn't contribute. Uh, so the, the uh, uh, one, right? Uh, no, no, because n e when n is equal to zero, this doesn't contribute because it's n equals zero here. Uh, so, so this is this equation is kosher as long as I th uh, don't include this term. So, um, uh, yeah, I want to get. Uh, yeah, I've done something not quite right, um, and also it's twelve thirty-three. So. <laughs> Let me, let me stop here and just say um, I, will I will finish this uh, with the start of the lecture tomorrow, but the point is that one is, let me tell what the answer is, because I know what the answer is. It's z minus 1 squared dg by dz. So I will derive this properly next time. I'll have all the steps uh, correct. But the point is that, um, you know, again, now it looks like, well, what do I do with this differential equation? This looks kind of hard. But it turns out that whenever you're dealing with linear stochastic processes of this type where there's birth, there's death, there's change in the number of particles, always, 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 when you introduce the generating function, you derive a first order 
partial differential equation. And in fact, this is nothing more than the wave equation in disguise. Or if you're more of a mathematical expert, you can solve this by the method of characteristics. But anyways, there is a standard set of toolkits of solving these sorts of differential equations. And we'll see very quickly that this equation can be solved really, really simply. And so one has a very simple expression for the generating function, and it turns out to be easy to invert it, and one gets the full probability distribution of number of particles. And so that's what I'll finish this first segment of this course Lisa, on please, tomorrow. Before you end up. Yes. Uh, what is P0, actually? What it is, is the very cheap function using n equal to 0. So P0, so P0 is the probability that there are no particles left in the system. So in fact, you know, as we're going to see, and you can, we, I can pose this as a question for the audience, which is like, if I start with one particle and I let the system evolve for a long time, what is the probability the system goes extinct? Does it go extinct for sure, or does it go extinct with a probability less than one? And so P0 is nothing more than the probability of extinction. And in biological or ecological problems, the extinction probability is crucial. And so P0 is really actually the fundamental quantity that we're typically interested in in solving these sorts of birth-death processes. Okay. So th that's what I will do next time. And I thank you, wherever you are, for your attention. <laughs> and uh, I wish you were here because it's, this is impossible. Yeah. Yeah. So